Um, okay, for those of you who aren't experts in the China theme park history, uh, in the in the market and the development of the theme park industry in China. Um, I wanted to turn it over to Mark and uh, TD will also help us as well. They're going to tag team this uh, brief history of the LBE industry in China. And if you'd like, I can give you that. Great. So I guess uh, I'm going to stand up so I can actually see what pictures uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be looking at. Just to raise hands first, like, who's been to China? So would that be a little over half? Who's not been to China? Okay. So as a reference, just as we start going through some of the different uh, uh, different parks and such, there's probably going to be two interesting points at the end of this that I want to I want to pull out that I think are interesting. Um, Essentially, how it all started, you know, and it was probably back in the, uh, well, one thing to remember with, within China is the speed of development, you know, it's just light years. So as we go back in time and we say, you know, 10 years ago, you know, it's like a whole eon ago, uh, a lot of these places, although they unfortunately look a little bit older than they are, really were coming around in the, you know, in the, uh, the 90s. And you really basically have uh, park amusement centers. That was really the first form of the LBE in, in China. Essentially, every city would have a park, a people's park, a center park, and they would have basically a collection of rides. Sometimes it would just be scattered around, uh, individual pay to play. Sometimes they'd actually be individually owned, like you know, the roller coaster would be owned by somebody, and the you know the Viking ship would be owned so on by somebody else. Some of them became a little bit more concentrated and, and centrally owned, and you had amusement parks. These are generally, and in fact, I'm going through a process now in inventorying. There's, there's about probably 800 of these or so in all of China. Most of them were developed, um, again, prior to the in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, then you really had in 1993, or actually the other one too, the uh, Splendid China. You had what would probably be the first gated attraction. Um, but not a, necessarily a theme park in the traditional ride sense. Uh, Windows of the World was down in Shenzhen and it was a lot of miniatures, but it was really one of the first ones where you actually had a, you know, a gate and, and more of the traditional LBE model where somebody would come and they'd spend four to five hours and they'd see a lot of different things. Um, after that, you actually had the first generation, what we'd call a, a traditional theme park. Uh, Happy Valley Shenzhen um, OTC was really the first project that uh, Sorry, uh, that opened, and it was a collection, a mishmash, a little bit of, of uh, traditional theme park rides along with theming and such, but really, as you can see with the building in the background, you know, stuck right in the middle of a big real estate project. Um, we now are into a second generation of theme parks. Uh, now some of the uh, Happy Valleys are taking a little bit on, but Fanta Wild, if you've never been, um, Actually, there's a question. How many people have heard of Fanta Wild? How, who has not heard of Fanta Wild? Okay. It's actually, by scale, it's probably the biggest theme park company in the world. They have 20, <laughs> over 20 different projects of, of scale of, of three to 400,000 square meters each. They're, they opened up four last year in China, and no one's ever heard of them here because they're all, all self-contained because... Biggest by area or biggest by attendance? Not by attendance, by property or so, uh, like the number. The Fanta Wild mostly focus on the uh, third or fourth tier city, and most of them are founded by the local government. So um, they grow very fast in China, but hmm. they cannot get the land in the major city. So that's why. That, that's their business target. It's the low end, low tickets, and you know, the local people need something to entertain. So that's why they built hmm. a lot in the past few years. But they've also, in a Chinese model, um, they make their own IP. They actually are vertically integrated. They do their own rides. They do their own production. And, uh, but actually, uh, very interesting. Uh, third year, uh, third tier city, fourth, fourth tier city is still system, Yeah. Yeah, our, our third or fourth tier city is, is different <laughs> by numbers, the, popula the population. Yeah. So <laughs> there's still lots of people. Um, a western variation of the second generation park too is, is what we like the, the Chimelong Park Ocean Kingdom 
where there's, there's been some uh, Western theme park influence. Uh, not as many, as you can see, but you know, that's more something we'd be traditionally accustomed to with the level of, of theming and, and integration of the rides. Um, also, indoor uh, parks kind of fall into that center. Check in, uh, you worked on this one in, in mm -hmm. Wuhan. Yeah. So they started to actually now branch out with different ideas, driven typically by the chairman. Uh, Shanghai Disney, I think, was a watershed moment, opened in 20, 2016, because you know, we're pretty familiar with it, but if you think about you know, the, the 1.3 billion or so Chinese, they have not seen, most of them had not really seen anything of this quality. Uh, they haven't really had the opportunity to go. Even at Hong Kong Disney really was not uh, available to most Chinese. So it's kind of been a watershed moment. Um, you know, it is you know, by far the, the biggest attendance, <clears throat> but also attendance times ticket price revenue. You know, it's, it's kind of in that model that, that actually they're driving you know, not only just visitors, but, but, but revenue. And the quality level is something that, you know, really, other than, say, maybe Ocean Park, no one's seen the kind of the exhaustive uh, level of detail in a park. It's been able to raise ticket prices. Uh, it kind of set the higher bar mark. Uh, now it's up to, well, we can have a side discussion on how prices translate, because things will always translate to lower, just because there's a difference between the exchange rate and what things really effectively cost. But uh, it's been able to really um, raise the bar on that. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of this one, Hawaii Brothers. Uh, this is again, uh, Hawaii Brothers is a movie company and they have their own movie-based IP and they've actually got into the, uh, the theme park industry between a th uh, physically developing, which I think this one was, and also a licensing model. Um, again, taking the quality level up, um, doing more uh, in, you know, immersive type rides that use their own IP as well as some of the more traditional um, uh, attractions. Um, VR theme parks, again, a, a new uh, direction. We'll talk more about that in a trend, but the Lionsgate Park uh, just opened uh, this year in um, Tension Island, so kind of a variation of IP VR, so taking it another level. Um, I also wanted to say something that we come across that's a little bit different and new to us is, is all the different variants of, of what we would consider location-based entertainment or, or kind of the gated theme park model. There are a lot of projects and products in China that from a business standpoint, somebody goes, they pay a ticket, they go see things, they, they stay a few hours that actually do very well and in some ways do better than, than theme parks because there's more s s cultural re uh, resonance with the, uh, with the Chinese. This one is a, a, a cultural village. So it's a whole, essentially you could call it a theme park based around a show and, and a lot of the traditional uh, culture of, of the Li and Yao minority, which is a, a minority ethnic group within Hainan Island in southern China. Water towns, um, you know, there's a history of these wonderful hutongs in China, you know, very visually interesting. Um, some of the original water towns, they actually went in, actually took them over, got, you know, kicked out people and, and actually made them into attractions. But they've actually, in this one, is a fully 100% recreated water town. Um, actually north of Beijing, about two hours, uh, Gubei water town. Now that, that place is amazing. I was there. You know, I'm in the industry. I saw everything like trash. But this one just amazed me. They relocated the original house from somewhere else and moved them to this place and rebuild it. So this is place you should visit when you come mm. to Beijing. So Can we get a discount? <laughs> <laughs> if they don't overcharge you, you'll be surprised. <laughs> Still only 100 TRMB to get in. But uh, it's interesting, again, the model, you know, it took us a while to get our, our hand around this, uh, this type of model where, you know, again, people are paying uh, 150 RMB to get in and like, well, what do you do in there? And it's like, well, you just go around. You can do a boat ride, you can eat, you know, it's kind of like a gated RD&E, but mm -hmm. visually, you know, the, the, the uh, architecture and the visual, they, they there is a show to, there too, I think. Yeah, they're, they're also very close to um, a Great Wall. So some people just go to the Great Wall in the evening. They do have Airbnbs in that water town, so you can Inns, actually yeah. sleep over there. 
Hmm. It's a different experience. It's very cool. Yeah, very popular. People want to sleep in the inns that kind of recreate a little bit of historic China. Again, it's resonating with their, their history. A side note on, on the design, one thing we can talk about. It's interesting how, you know, when you see some of the Chinese designers trying to recreate American style theme park design, you know, we look at it and we kind of go, uh. But when you look at something like that, you know, they can nail it. So it's an interesting, um, you know, they know what are the references that are most important in the design. Uh, historical gated attractions. This is another uh, relatively large gated theme park. It's about uh, the Song Dynasty. Uh, there's actually a, a painting, Millennial Park, and they've recreated the painting within a theme park. Again, hmm. not a lot to do, but you go around in the buildings and there's little shows and such. So it kind of fits within that theme park model, but not what we're normally used to. Another extremely popular gated attraction, the uh, Nanshan down in Hainan Island. It's essentially, you know, this big uh, Buddha statue, which, you know, you think would be there for years and years. It was actually only about 10 years old, if that. Um, and they've recreated some other uh, Buddha temples. And it's pro right now it's the most popular attraction, over five or six million visitors in, in Hainan Island. Um, and it's a, a side note on that, very interesting, is that there's a whole separate industry within that where people will actually donate thousands of dollars to be able to put their family statue up in, next to the, uh, hmm. the Buddha. So again, they've created this uh, attraction around a cultural aspect of that. Um, before I turn it over to you, I'd say two interesting points come up. Uh, up. One is what you see going on a lot of times, and again with the generation, um, the Chinese you know, probably have two really, uh, an upside and downside aspect. One is you know, they want to do everything, they want to learn, they want to do it. They say, oh, I see that, I can do it. They do it, we look at it, we say, nah, you didn't really quite do it. But what will happen is They'll come with another generation, they'll do it again, they'll learn, they'll learn. And they will continue to uh, you know, move up the scale. The other important point is if you look at the time frame of some of that, again, this is not even within a generation. And one of the things is you know, we forget how ingrained our industry is within our culture. Like if somebody says, oh, a theme park, oh yeah, yeah, I know what that is because I went there as a kid and I'm going to take my kids there. Uh, you don't have that in China. You have these other things. That's why some of them do actually better in the beginning is that they don't have cultural references necessarily to traditional theme park LBE. So, you know, they didn't go as a kid, so they don't really understand that it's a, you know, a eight hour length of stay and it's worth all this, this uh, money to put into it. So, kind of interesting uh, in the development of that. Yeah, the reason I put this uh, for the city up so next green slide, button. green button. Oh, big, cool. big, big, the oh, okay. <laughs> Very obvious. Uh, the, the, the reason I put the, for, uh, the Forbidden City up was because the, this is one of the must visit places. We'll come to Beijing and beside the Great Wall, Summer Palace, etc. but the Forbidden City. To us, this, uh, this Forbidden City is like a red wall after red wall and palace after palace. All, everything looks the same. It's boring to us. But this one is 600 years old, and now it's only open a small portion, and the major portion was not open to public. So there's a lot of um, interesting stories people created that why they cannot open the rest of the, the palace. It was because there's a monster in there to protect <laughs> the palace, etc. So we heard a, a lot of story about that. But when they have um, a curator named Mr. Shan, they turn this 600 year old national treasure into something very fun. They introduced the high technology and the entertainment stuff into the Forbidden City. And now it becomes a, they call the internet celebrity site. The young people go to there, taking their selfies, post on the social media to present they are a very cool person. So now they have, um, uh, coffee shop, coffee shop there since last year. People go there, don't for, not asking for a good coffee, but just <coughs> hold the coffee sh coffee cup and take a selfie and post it. That's it. <laughs> and they also had a, a hot pot starting from the last winter. 
and closed it down a few months later due to some uh, some security or uh, fire protection reason, whatever. But they tried the hot pot in the Forbidden City as well. And during the the big green button up above that, with one button a little higher. That's oh, this one. Okay, so. This one looks like a big disco club. <laughs> that what they put together in a few months, very short time, and then presented during the uh, Chinese Lantern Festival, which is on the 15th of January in the lunar calendar. So this one only open to public for like three, oh, three days or a week. So the young people saying, we can go to the Forbidden City to dance. Yeah. So that's what they put together. It's fun. This is very cool. So as I said, that they introduced some high technology and also the, the interactive space, as inter interactive exhibits there. See, you can see that they can interact with a big screen. So you can try to put on the emperor's robe and also watching a film, a history and film. And also the merchandise becomes the major part with, you know, people, they're making fun of our emperors. So, and now they have over hundreds, over, I think, a few hundreds of merchandise you can purchase online or on their offline stores. <coughs> the revenue last year, in 2018, was two billion RMB. And their lipsticks literally sold out in the first day when they launched online. And so they, found out that the manufacturing cannot produce that many lipsticks. <laughs> so they just uh, shut it down and we will open it a few months later. Maybe come to the US. <laughs> maybe. So maybe co-produce co with some um, major brands. Even the McDonald's, they're having a bucket with the uh, Forbidden City brand. Now it's one of the popular brands in China. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If our national treasure can do something like that, so as the others, we say we call that 5A uh, tourist site. So some others are starting copying this uh, Forbidden City style, putting their merchandise out, like the Summer Palace, they always have big sales after this. So this is like a beginning of we're turning some historian site into a more entertaining, uh, fun place. Thank you. So um, I'd like to take a moment to ask the panelists about the underpinnings of all of these uh, creations. You know, like why is this happening? And why is it happening at such a large scale and so rapidly? What are the market forces or uh, other forces that are, are driving this industry in your experience? Anyone want to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll jump in first. I mean, one thing is is obviously, you know, a huge middle class. As income growth happens, you know, we use uh, GDP as a proxy, and the, you know, they say it's a bad year when it's only six percent. But you know, you compound that out when you see the the level of income, you know, at a at a mass market scale. There's just much more of an appetite uh, for entertainment product in, in the mix. Now, you know, if you really break it out, most of it's still going to housing and food and fashion and all these things. But, you know, just the pure, pure scale of it says, you know, there's more disposable income for, for entertainment. I, I would also say, you know, think numerically. It's fascinating. People here don't really, if you haven't been to China, understand the scale of the population in the cities. When, when you think about raising to that point of the middle class, at 1.7 billion people, raising 30% of that population to the even the lower middle class, numerically, is more people than every man, woman, and child in the United States. When you think about the economic power that is there and is available numerically, is, is quite incredible. I, th I think the other one is the like the acceleration of all the other developments uh, in in that market. Um, there was an acceleration of real estate development, and uh, you know where I'm going to go with this. So, so <laughs> one of the ways to to get more approvals for more real estate development is to is to make your development more attractive than the next one, 
And we've seen a lot of the sort of real estate plays where it's like, yeah, 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 I'm going to build all these residential towers. And usually that's not one or two. Usually it's like eight or 20. <clears throat> but I'm going to make mine different by adding a theme park. So can I get approval? Sure. You know, get the land, get the money, start building. But oddly enough, a lot of times they'll build the residential towers first and sell them all and the park never gets built. Or it gets built halfway or it gets built, you know, not what they showed the provincial governor. So, so that, you know, the push to have faster and faster growth of more and more real estate developments, I think that was one of the push uh, areas for adding entertainment, if you could call it that. Um, another thing is the, the Chinese government opened the second child policy in 2016. Before that, some, only the major cities um, know the uh, so two conditions you need to, ma you need to make uh, before 2016. Either both of the parents are uh, single child, or one of the parents had a high education, means at least a college degree. So after 2016, more and more young people, like after 80s, they can have the second child. Um, in that, in 2017, you need one year to make a kid. So in 2017, there's a 17, uh, no, 17 million newborns. In 2018, there are 15 million newborns. The numbers are dropping because people found out they spent a lot of money to raise a kid in China. <laughs> so they are getting, you know, not just the get rush now that I need a kid, that second kid or third kid. Just after they made the calculation to put the kid in a good school costs a lot of money. Even put the kid in a good kindergarten costs a lot of money. So. <coughs> Now the numbers start dropping. But with that amount of newborns, parents need to take the kid to go to see something during the holidays. So that's why there's a lot of new things coming up. The theme parks, the, inter uh, the uh, indoor FECs, outdoor parks uh, stopped booming a few years ago after that. I think the, the, the one factor that I think all of this has to connect to is that the entertainment is really regulated in China. It's the government who is setting the uh, pace of the development. It's the government who is the Beijing government that is allowing the growth to happen at its own pace. It's not a natural thing. There's very little entrepreneurial entertainment in China, as far as I've ever seen. So it takes government regulation, like Bob mentioned, to get land approved, to do things. It takes government initiatives from the president to say we're going to go into this sector and expand it. And so I think it could grow a lot faster if it was a, more of a free enterprise where entrepreneurs can come in and create an experience. There's, there's no like theater world, you know, there's no you know, community theater happening, there's very little filmmaking being done in China, it's all regulated, so as long as there is that um, restraint, I don't see the market growing as fast as maybe we would all like to see it. I think that is something that is being slowed down by the government and maybe it has to be managed that way just to keep control of it because that's what China wants to do. Well, I think some of that too, as we can all attest to, some of the growth is unsubstantiated by the feasibility studies that are generated for some of the products that are being developed and built. Uh, it's interesting that at one point the government was really promoting the development of these entertainment complexes for the release of land and then a couple of years ago because there was clearly some feasibility issues with a number of the products being developed they intentionally put a break on how these projects could be developed or acquired and then they shifted uh, significantly toward a cultural mindset where they were mandating the development of these 1,100 cultural locations, uh, which we are now participating in, has become uh, like the theme parks were about five or eight years ago, the rush to build these products, these new villages and these cultural components are, are facing that kind of same push through the cycle at this point in time. Which gets to the demand, you know, I mean, it's one thing to project the demand because you see the middle class growing, you take the percentage of that and you assume that all these people are going to want to do something, but it's not really showing up at the turnstiles. These people are not coming to these things at all in the um, amounts of, that we've projected, and that's where 
you know, overbuilding of projects happen, and I think Mark can attest to that, that there's pretty much no theme park in China that is making money, right? So um, to, keep, to keep the... Less than 10 based on the industry report that makes money. Trimlo is one of that. You know, um, it seems to me that the, the government influence here is also very important to point out in that maybe making money for the community or for the, the owner is not the primary concern. It's entertaining the populace, right, in all forms. And that it, I was hearing, you know, from owners around China, they were saying that I can't get my new building approved unless I, I present a fully featured plan that has accommodations for the full family and for recreation and leisure and hopefully some cultural relevance. So I think there's probably a, you know, a difference between the guys that, that mean it, the, the owners that mean it, they want to do something genuine, genuine that they can be proud of and that they put their all into and perhaps the owners that are just kind of doing it as a check the box obligation. So you know, perhaps look out for, for that pitfall. <laughs> you know, like you just mentioned uh, earlier before we started this panel, the group got together and we were talking a little bit about how a theme park, the way we understand it from our culture, is something that is not native at all in China. That uh, for Chinese families to go to somewhere like Shanghai Disneyland, they've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to expect. They also maybe come with an extended family. And so a lot of times there's, you know, uh, grandparents that come along, which typically don't like going on dark rides and roller coasters. So you get a lot of people that are coming through the gate that are there just to um, uh, be together with maybe their one younger yeah. child who can enjoy it. But one kid is not going to really have a great time going on a ride by himself or going through these things. So there's something I think that's going to take a few more generations to figure out what this location-based entertainment is all about and how to enjoy it. I, I also think for just from experience there too that the, this, the, the makeup of the typical Chinese family in China is a lot different than what we would see a family in the West. You know, the uh, father figure in the West, you know, I think it somehow has learned to, especially my generation, has learned to play with their children, you know, in a silly way, and to be willing to put on mouse ears or to do something silly or play a game with their kid when I think uh, a Chinese parent of my age in China, that's something off-putting. And I haven't seen a lot of parents really enjoying themselves when I visited parks at all. Uh, the kids are doing it, but the parents are not really enjoying uh, it. Most of the parents are so into their cell phone. When the kids are playing, they're just playing with the cell phone. We also have a saying that the father's love is like a mountain because it never moves. So <laughs> mm. yeah, well, one more thing to mention is that uh, I've experienced this, uh, that people keep saying that, that they take their relatives and their friends to experiences because it's it's such a giving culture they want to show how much they care about their visitors and their relatives when they come to town to be able to say hey we're gonna go to the latest new thing or the big show and we're gonna buy the VIP tickets front row you know uh, first class and we're doing this for you because we love you whether or not they even understand what they're signing up for you know, that's why I think there's a lot of spectaculars, there's a lot of water, you know, giant water fountain shows, things that can be a focal point for uh, the celebration among you and your family or close VIP, even business friends. I would say also very different than what we are customarily uh, thinking of. Many things are done as a group in China. You know, many people take a tour. It's not a nuclear family as to what uh, is being said. You know, the sense is that there are four grandparents, two parents, the one child, and we design the experiences around that to en engage the group. But typically it's, you know, 30 to 60 people on a tour together. It's not an individual family traveling to these, so there's a very different a sense of how the experience is digested, uh, which drives some of the design process. And I would also say length of stay is quite different. You know, there's not necessarily a drive to be at the park the minute it opens and, and stay till the end of the day. It's digested in more of, a, I would say, a variety format where shows are much more popular 
in, in the Chinese market. Uh, it's not so much ride driven. Uh, there's a lot more entertainment that's uh, on tap and the success of the shows uh, that are in China. Uh, I think attest to how the market uh, is informing what the entertainment offering is. Okay, we're going to move to the next section, which is that uh, many of our panelists have put together the case studies of some recent projects or, or oldies but goodies that they felt uh, they wanted to uh, use as a case study so we can really start to understand how some of their learnings have, have come to be. And so I want to start off here with Bob. I will give you the magical remote. It's a magical remote. And I'm going to turn on my eyes. So I'm going to turn on my eyes in the back of my head so I don't have to turn around. <laughs> um, but this, this first project here is uh, part of the construction of the Chimelong uh, Ocean Kingdom on Henching Island, which is very close to Macau. Uh, and what's, what's interesting about it was that the chairman, Mr. Su, um, well, we would watch him go back and forth between making choices that we would expect, sort of more traditional Chinese chairman decisions, and then one day, driven by factors that we didn't know, he would turn around and buy a, a, a B&M roller coaster, which is probably a $20 million purchase, which, he, you know, he could buy a Chinese equivalent for a fraction of that. Um, and then go back to buying Chinese round rides, which are, are very inexpensive. And then the next day, you know, buy three uh, mock rides from the from the German manufacturer. So it was, it, it wasn't it. He was following a different system for sure. Um, but within the park, uh, not only did they have traditional um, uh, rides, but he also had uh, animal shows. It's it's a little bit like a Sea World park. And you can see the progression of how some of these uh, 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 attractions get developed. We were focusing mostly on the technology and the scenery. Um, but, but a lot of times, you know, that first picture was a model and there were no formal drawings. The scenic company literally had the model in their shop and then they literally had the model out on site. So that's one big difference if you're going to talk about production. Um, and then, of course, it, it worked for some of the other uh, um, aspects as well. This other attraction, you can kind of see the level of, of, I mean, it is a construction site, and it's not like an American construction site. I, I don't have to explain the difference, no but hats. you can see it. A lot of times, no closed-toed shoes. Uh, you had yours on, but, you know, the guys working didn't. Um, but you can see how it starts to come together. The, the final finish looks great. You know, the, the final product ends up being very high quality and um, works really well. One unusual aspect of, of these two attractions you just saw is that we spent an enormous time. We were working alongside um, Renaissance uh, Entertainment out of Orlando, and that's John Binkowski and Lisa Smith, if you know them. And, and they're very creative, and they would come up with fantastic um, story-driven shows that were going to be worked around the animal behaviors, and it was going to be like a, a, you know, a SeaWorld-level show. And we got close to the end, and Mr. Sue said, ah, you know what, they don't, the, the, the audience doesn't going to care. Just put somebody out there with a microphone, and they can, they can you know, <laughs> say what the, what the dolphin's going to do next. And that's plenty good. And they would have 5,000 people in the audience cheering because, you know, the animal did something. But there was, like, all the work we put into the show ended up going out the window. It's fascinating. <clears throat> So real quick, this last one is the um, so what we like to call the kitchen sink lagoon show because it has everything in it and a kitchen sink. Um, <laughs> and as it started to come together, it it became you know a centerpiece for the for the park at night and did do its job. It kept the people in the park longer. They spent more and and uh, and and uh, uh, basically capped their night with something special. Is that the last I think one? there is uh, one or two more little uh, slides from your collection. So let's so. go. Oh, okay. So this one is a little different. This was um, a, a project that we did for uh, a Haichung uh, Polar Ocean uh, project in, in Shanghai. And um, this was an interesting project because the, the chairman uh, said, you know what, there's no budget. Go make me a great uh, water parade. I don't care if it's Disney quality or above. You know, go make me something amazing. And we spent all this time creating this great concept uh, and animating it and, and showing him how we could have performers on these water floats and, you know, effects and all these cool things, truly world class. 
and we get back and presented it, and of course, it fell completely on its face, because the first thing he said was, I can't afford this. <laughs> it was almost like, what the hell's wrong with you? It's so it was, it was a challenge, you know, it's, it's a it's real like challenge a, trying to make it work. It's like a 10 minute long video too, huh? Oh yeah, it's yeah. the whole, yeah. it's the entire, <laughs> it's the entire uh, uh, concept for the show animated. So you, you know exactly what each float is and what each performer is doing and how it's going to, you know, uh, uh, animate and how it's going to move and mm. what parts you need. And I, I mean, it was, you know, we were ready to go to schematic design and it was like, nope, <clears throat> we're not going to do that. I'm sure someone will buy it eventually, so. Yeah. Hopefully. We never reuse anything. You know how that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this last one is, is, is we, we were joking about it before. It's not actually in China, um, but the running joke was, well, it's Singapore, so there's a lot of Chinese in Singapore. Singaporean Chinese are very common. Uh, what was interesting about this project was, uh, again, the, the chairman wanted to have something very, very big. And these birds, these metal birds, are over 100 feet tall. And they come to life once a night and do this entire show out in the sea, uh, being sprayed by seawater and you know, just something we would never really contemplate here in the States. Um, but not only did he want it, but it was also a, a casino, which we don't have in mainland China. We have in Macau. And there's been some pretty crazy projects in Macau in terms of the size driven by the fact that it's a casino that you will not see in a theme park. Hmm. So I thought that was an interesting project. Uh, this is another one, speaking of Macau. So this is about a $25 million indoor fountain that the chairman wanted to have in his uh, casino. And he literally said in a meeting, I want one because Steve Wynn has that tree of prosperity thing. So because he has one, I want to have one. And mine should be a diamond. OK, it's going to be a diamond. So we made this very large uh, diamond fountain show for him in his lobby, and that was that was the extent of it. I mean, a lot of people you don't pay tick you don't pay for a ticket to see it. It's really an amenity show, right? It's free to the guests. It's just close enough to the entrance of the casino that it might make you come in. <clears throat> but the reality is, in Macau, the the gaming, which is probably a, a topic for another talk, the the, the drive for for gaming is so strong from the from the mainland Chinese gambler, but you, don't almost, you almost don't need this. They, they're going to come and spend money. So mm. it's, it's, it's a very interesting Makes uh, a hell of market. a selfie, though. Hmm? It's, it, it is a hell of a selfie. <laughs> and was just uh, one. one last one, I guess. This is uh, going back to Singapore as well. Um, as an example of a project, this is actually the, the escalator experience going down to the casino. So uh, unlike what we do in the, in the States, where the escalator is pretty much going to be an escalator and some graphics, you know, this thing came to life. He wanted sound, he wanted video, he wanted you know, all these different things to come together to make it like, oh, you'll remember you're going down to the casino. Um, and then this is back in uh, Macau. Uh, we made an attraction that was, I guess you could call it an interactive fountain. So there was water in there. and. If you waved your hand a certain way, you could cause something to happen with these giant crystals. And it wasn't very much story driven, much more aesthetic, but again, a, a great photo op mm. uh, for the, this one happened to be in the <coughs> bus lobby. Mm. So a lot of people passing through there. Well, thank you, Bob. And uh, if you wouldn't mind passing it just two to your left to our friend Steve. And take I, I can't see Steve. behind myself, so I'll stand up over okay. here. Um, my experience in China has been, you know, vast and a lot of different little projects. When I first started, getting stuck in the mic there. Mm -hmm. All right, um, can I sit here? Yeah. The uh, I fell in love with China when I started my company, and I went to work with um, the Chinese athletes to put on a live theatrical show. And so I was crazy enough to just go to China and start start it and meet people hooked up with uh, athletes and started a project that we eventually got some performances on. Uh, found myself back in China working with um, Paramount on a couple of different projects trying to get their theme parks built. Uh, working with Universal Studios Singapore, we work with the largest uh, Chinese construction company who built all of the core and shell of that project, a company called MCC. Uh, some experience with Wanda Group and uh, on a couple of projects, more with Paramount and then also with um, 
um, Evergrande on the more recent thing. So as you can sort of see from this little clip reel, there's been a, a variety of things that I was able to work on. And it's uh, interesting from very small theatrical experiences to master planning parks, working with land developers, trying to figure out where is the perfect site for a park, developing master plans with IP holders uh, such as Paramount which is great when you're working for the Paramount side you know as a designer and as a design lead you're getting everything you want in the project and then when you get to work with a Chinese owner trying to bring all of that quality you're challenged a little bit with what they want versus what you think is maybe the best uh, role to play so again, you know, on Paramount, uh, some, uh, some of the stuff that was done years ago in China, a lot of folks worked on this project. It, unfortunately, it never got built. It ran, uh, they ran into funding issues after it was designed. And like so many of these things, you never see. So this one, uh, another one that was done more recently uh, uh, in five different cities, they were looking at developing parks. But again, the difficulties of getting land out of the government developers having their um, uh, the right connections and all the investment there the design gets done but then it sort of piddles out when it comes time to actually doing the brick and mortar but with Evergrande I think uh, a lot of people have been working now with Evergrande on their mainland China project which is called Fairyland uh, a lot of design companies are now involved in the development of that Lewis has been working with them on and off and I found that to be the most challenging of all the stuff that I've been able to do in China is working with this developer who's got big dreams, brings in really qualified people, and then doesn't listen to any of us. And uh, I don't know if maybe the rest of the panel can figure out a way as to why that is, that you bring in the Western experts. And as TT said earlier, you know, you wanted to work with the Westerners because we're supposed to be the experts. We have all the knowledge. But then it comes down to actually pulling the trigger and they want to go in a different direction that is just uh, eventually beats the care out of a lot of us as designers. And so, you know, you're the client. If this is what you want us to do, we'll do it again and again and again. And I guess our experience and your money becomes our money and their experience, you know? So <laughs> anyway, that's my little say. Okay, and uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back to our main event here and we will go to Louis Alfieri. Oh, thank you. Uh, come over here, I can see the picture. So, you know, I, I want to carry, just before we start the slides, you know, kind of carry through that discussion that Steve started. You know, the Chinese owners are very mercurial people. It's very interesting to deal with the owners of the companies uh, because of how they perceive themselves, how they perceive their knowledge base, how they perceive their position within the culture, uh, with the party. The party is ubiquitous. The party is a driver for everything that's happening and approving things. Uh, particularly this move, this project actually right now, Junlunko, that we're working on, is a major new national park resort development health and wellness center uh, about four hours north of Shanghai. And the whole focus of it is red culture. So we're working on this uh, party mandated concept that's being driven by uh, the chairman of the company and the local party members to facilitate this health and wellness component, which is really where our influence is on the entertainment component. But then having to understand and incorporate uh, this red cultural aspect that's under uh, significant development right now from the, the central, central government. Each of the chairmen that we work with, and many of us have all worked with the same chairman together, uh, have a similar experience. Like when I started with Wanda, I got on a plane with Wan Jianling and flew around the world and went to all these theme parks while he like, was like a menu. I want one of those, I want one of those, I want one of those, I want one of those. Uh, and started down the process where we got the team together. Many of the people in the room here were, were brought together on that project. Uh, the first one, Wuhan, was uh, incredibly audacious. You know, a lot of people know it's gone, it's been closed. Uh, you know, it defied logic from a feasibility standpoint from, from the onset. Uh, but what it did accomplish, though, is something that's never been done here, was to vertically stack a theme park. You know, to take major attractions like a fly theater, uh, a Terminator, and a uh, Star Tours and put them on top of each other. Now, aesthetically, the inside of the building, there were a lot of things that don't work or weren't functional. 
but the audacity of the project and the ability to accomplish it, to make some, you know, four of the six attractions were as good, if not better, than Bush Gardens attractions. So I think there's a lot to be said about the audacity of the concept of what's done over there and the ability to execute. Uh, I believe one of the challenges we face with each of these mercurial owners is that you can't really implement change on a wholesale basis. You know, it's really kind of day in, day out. Can you make an incremental difference with the people that you're working with who will lead the projects in the future? Because the guys you're working with right now don't really want to listen to you. The question is, what are you doing now that may influence things uh, in the future? So. Um, I think that's kind of my perspective on, on how we deal with the day-to-day -day trip into the twilight zone. Because really, some days it's really far out, you know, the experience. Um, but, you know, right now, uh, Jun Lunko, as I mentioned before, this is an interesting project that, again, uh, this is a water town, a reconstituted swamp, if you will, that's nine rivers that come into this area that flood that's going to become a major destination that's intended to have 24 million people. I want you to understand that today there are 24,000 people visiting a year. In five years they want 24 million. And, and you know, they've partnered with an airline group. I mean, the, the, the plans, as usual, are vast and far-reaching. Uh, but the construction process, the planning is there. It, you know, it's in development and we'll see where it goes. You know, the, the opportunity from a scale standpoint, the district that, that's overall, the shows that are incorporated, redeveloping from a cultural standpoint, something called the Hawaii Opera is a major component of this development and uh, it's an interesting project to be involved with and the team that's heading it up is very passionate. So uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to work with the folks in China and when you get a team that's really not just doing it from a property standpoint but because they're excited about it, uh, it's a great opportunity to work with them and, and, and see where we can go with the project. Uh, and this, as I mentioned, the red culture. Now, these are some of the mandates uh, from the team and the party to instill uh, this sense of pride and uh, integrity in the overall cultural aspect of what's being delivered and done in the, in, in the project. Uh, interesting that, that uh, you mentioned earlier by Shijo, which is where the first OCT project was. We're working on the redevelopment right now of the central section of Bai Shijo, which is a lifestyle complex which will incorporate all of these new skyscrapers. And again, here we don't, you know, the Hudson Yards project is a major project in the United States. That's like a pittance in China. You know, they, they basically come in, take all these folks that are living here, they move them out of the area en masse. You know, they'll move a million people, no problem build these facilities up, give everybody five apartments, and, and you'll get some money and, and move back in. And, and it's just part and parcel to the entire process of, of what goes on there. So this is a redevelopment of roughly 10 square kilometers of, of, of Shenzhen. This is the major section in the middle of it where there'll be a whole entertainment lifestyle complex. We're working on the cultural programming for that, the overall integration of the park area, um, like the High Line that you're familiar with in Manhattan. Um, exciting project. This has a 10-year uh, from, from conceptual approval to final skyscraper open and inhabited 10, 10 years overall. You couldn't imagine doing that in 50 years in our country, but, uh, you know, and they want to squeeze it down to five. So this gives you a sense of kind of some of the area that, that that's going to be, uh, all of these folks will be relocated. Uh, and then uh, we mentioned Evergrande. This, this project is, is one that I, it defies explanation. Uh, it, it is a project of immense scale, easily ten times the size of the Palm. Uh, this project uh, started about eight years ago. We've been involved with it for three years now. Uh, this project is of a scale unimaginable. It's, it's anything you can think of in an entertainment location integrated and built in one location. 56 resorts, eight museums, water park, animal park, theme park, convention center, information center, movie studio, spas, I mean, it, it, 50, uh, 15,000 residential units, uh, two hours from anywhere. And the island didn't exist. Correct. These are, these are all manufactured. These are all manufactured islands. So I'll uh, give you a little sense of kind of where this project is at. The, these pictures, uh, you'll see a video in a moment uh, where we're at. Uh, the mandate is to open next October. 
So this gives you a little sense. Good this luck, is Lewis. A, this is <laughs> this is uh, where we're at right now on the site. So uh, these are two Hilton hotels, uh, and it's a, a floral theme, right? Yes, yes. And 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 uh, what's interesting is they just approved last week pulling all the sidewalk up to do an immense light show over every building on every island, which is also to meet the same time. And and again, this is to the mercurial owner. You know, you have, there's no problem. We're going to figure out a way to do this in 12 months projection map, everything on the island. I like how everywhere you go, there's someone sweeping up the trash. It's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, many of these projects right now, the interiors are not designed yet, but the idea is to fulfill those obligations and build those in the next 12 months. No, this is interesting. This is two hours west of Heiko. So, what's that? Which means it's uh, well, it, it's, it's really, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing here. There's, there's a, it, it's fascinating just from, we talk about the feasibility standpoint, you know, they're very confident uh, that this will be uh, incredibly well attended. You know, the, the, the assumption that there will be 45,000 people a day just in, in the parks. Uh, numerically, it's hard for us to make sense of. You know, when you look at you know some of the other projects on the island supporting that or access to these projects, uh, all of these things can be solved if, like the government of Dubai, which is the, the greatest branding solution that's ever been in the world, if they can get motivation behind the government, behind the travel agencies, and they can mandate going here, it can be a success. Uh, at the moment. I am challenged to believe that the feasibility study and that operational model from this owner is in place to achieve that level of success, but we'll see. But, you know, believe it or not, even it's in the middle of nowhere, but most of the apartments they built there are sold out. Yes. And people buying the apartment or villas as their investment, even they don't live there, but they're just thinking as a good investment. So all sold out, most of them are sold out. And each apartment or villa costs over a million RMB. These so 15,000 units sold out in the first 48 hours that they were on the market. The entire place is sold out. Hmm. And in, interestingly enough, uh, the, the challenge Evergrande is having at the moment is they've also decided to build an electric car. Uh, something, a business that they were not in. So at the same time they're building these islands, they're also building 15 theme parks and 15 other locations in the country simultaneously, and they've decided to become General Motors uh, at, at the same time and Tesla, because it's an electric car. So we also uh, have worked with uh, Hungian World Studios, which uh, is the largest movie studio in the world. Uh, they, it's interesting, this, this project, uh, Chris has been there with me, uh, Again, speaking of audacious and scale, they've built the Forbidden City one-to-one -one scale. <laughs> the entire Forbidden City. Mm -hmm. uh, Even the area you can't see normally. It, it's it's uh, one, incredible. One to zero point nine nine something. Yeah. To us, they we, we thought they got the original plan of the Forbidden City, and so they just uh, built everything there. And most of the um, ancient Chinese films have captured in the Forbidden City. And in Hongdian Studio, they used to host over a thousand uh, production, productions at one time. So you cannot have a long shot because you may see five productions going on at the same time. So mm -hmm. that happens, yeah. Is the road any better than when we experienced it as a dirt road? No, no. still. It's pig, pretty pig, bumpy. Pigs and there. goats. But what's interesting, too, is their <laughs> business model is very different than most other institutions. They allow a lot of free shooting on site, or semi-free, if you will, in an effort to have the IP and the content that they're developing. They actually own seven theme parks, each uh, developed to a different uh, time zone in, in the history of China. Much of their work is kind of cultural in, in that aspect for the film shooting, which I'm sure you've shot films there before. Yes, a few, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, this place becomes so popular. Uh, you know, last month, first of uh, October, and that's a seven days holiday, so our national holiday, one of the longest uh, holiday, biggest holiday in China. And the Hongdian studio is packed with people. And you know, 
most of people go there, not the you know, senior lady tour thing, but the young generations, because lots of them are celebra celebrity fans. They go there because their idol shot a film or TV shows there. They need to take a picture of the original site. So they go there. And they just opened the flying theater. My husband was there. And they opened during the uh, national holiday. Each day, they host the, like 5,000 visitors every day. So it's a seven, uh, it's an ADC theater, flying theater, and like 10 hours operation. So every day they just packed with people. Right. That's crazy. <coughs> yes. Well, it's interesting. Most people wouldn't, you know, they, nobody here in the U.S. has heard of them, but they have 17 million, you know, visitors a year. I mean, it, it's a, it's a huge. Opportunity. I just go for the restaurant and the hotel. Huh? <laughs> and Hong is very hard to get to. They don't have a direct flight. You need to transfer from Yiwu, one of the biggest wholesale market in the world. So it's a like a half an hour drive from Yiwu, and you can fly there or take a train from Shanghai to Yiwu, then yeah. drive half an hour to Hong I remember it was, when you took me there. You go to the airport in Yiwu, and it feels like you're in a and like most Eisley, you know, <laughs> but with like the UN and the, the world's population is just showing up there with like samples from the various factories that are around the area. Basically everything that's built on the dollar store, Walmart, everywhere you go comes from this location in Iwu. It's, it's really incredible to just walk through the malls there. Every piece of furniture, is, it's, it's astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, this right now, this project just, is in the process of opening. So uh, three companies, primarily three Western companies, worked on this. So uh, Goddard Group did master planning for this project, who's been announcing uh, that quite, quite a bit recently. We did five attractions there, and Forex did five attractions there for, for this project. This is the Shanghai Bunt Park. And again, this is a, a nearly one-to-one -one recreation of the Shanghai Bunt on, on their river that, that's opening right now. Uh, so you can see, you know, uh, this project is well on its way, and in the next five to six months, all the attractions should be open and, and uh, active. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis. Okay, uh, TD, please take it away. With uh, we have one final section, and I saved the best for last. Uh, we want to start talking about some of the trends uh, that are affecting the market these days. Yeah, because I'm based in China, so I may know a little more than all those experts about the, what the to uh, hot topics in China. So those are the IPs. As you know that we have discussed, the, for the developers, the reason they, need, they can't get the land is they need to build something with the tourists, like either a theme park or tourist destination. But now it's getting hard and hard, harder and harder to get the land, so they need higher uh, level of products, so they need to get it, get the all the IPs in, and most of the Chinese people knows those IPs are quite well, and some of them already had a park like Shanghai Disney already had a park, and also Legoland based on the latest industry news, uh, Lego gonna build their first park in um, uh, where that Chengdu, so as all the IPs so and the Forbidden City, and in. The last year, the two popular popular IPs opened in uh, Shanghai. The Shanghai Times with the Hello Kitty. Uh, one of the uh, Hello Kitty is well known by the you know, young generations, and they used to have uh, no, they still have a park in uh, Zhejiang Province, but that park was uh, kind of a big failure because they were not prepared well before opening, so the price was not very good. But now they opened another one in Shanghai, in downtown Shanghai. And it's a 6,000 square meters, and they charge 144 RMB for each person. And they also opened the um, Pepe Pig. Pepe Pig is so hot in China, unbelievable hot. <laughs> so, and then they opened the first FEC in Shanghai as well, and they charge like uh, 158 uh, RMB, uh, one kid plus one parent. But most of the time, one kid will be brought by two parents and two grandparents. So they make a lot of money from the grandparents. And also the um, Automatic Explorer from uh, National Geography, they opened the, um, the park in uh, Shenyang last year. 
and also the um, Plants vs. Zombie, it's a mobile game brand. So they also opened an outdoor park in Jiangsu, Jiangsu province. It was in Wuxi. There is a 40,000 square meter land and they charge 120 RMB per each person. Wuxi. Jiangsu. Jiangsu Wuxi, yes. And talking about the VR and AR, so as the rest of the world, everybody is talking about it in China. And they used to have over 1,000 companies who, who announced that they can produce AR and VR things. And most of the AR uh, VR things are like uh, standalone attractions in the shopping mall. So that, but they are uncomparable to the void or the uh, dreamscape we, um, we have in States. Those are just hardcore VR experience, putting it on a roller coaster and just doing the you know, kind of things. And we use the VR, uh, AR as um, uh, the AR books, so you can uh, see actual things from your mobile phone through an app. And so we have a lot of books with uh, uh, AR technology. And also we use AR on the escape room. So escape room is also popular in China. So the latest version, they use the AR technology. Mm. <coughs> and since we have a lot of uh, newborn babies, so we do need lots of uh, indoor attractions. So FECs and family restaurants become popular from two years ago. Uh, one good example is the Nail Bell. Uh, happens to uh, happens I know the owner, and two mm -hmm. young ladies from a very wealth, a wealthy family. So they founded their um, first park uh, FEC in Shanghai, kind of out of nowhere, one hour drive from downtown. But this uh, it becomes so you know, how to say that, so popular. People line up every day to get into this small facility, only 2,000 square meters, and they charge like 300 RMB as kind of Disney ticket money, but still people line up because they had never seen something like that before. <coughs> to us, the designer is an um, interior designer. They, she knows barely nothing about this industry, but they know how to design things which looks good in the camera. So we say, they designed this uh, VC for the parents, especially the young parents, they can take a selfie. It looks like it's um, Las Vegas inspired, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they use the Macalon color, so which is very fancy. And uh, we also have some small scale uh, indoor attractions, like a kids theme. They have like uh, 15 parks, uh, 15 FECs around China, um, nine in Beijing, and the rest are in the other parts of China. And uh, Miland, you can see uh, Nail Bell, uh, Miland looks very similar to Nail Bell. To us, it's the um, washed down version of Nail Bell. So, you know, in China, it's very popular that when you see one thing gets super hot, the others will follow. The style, not copy, just we follow, get inspired. Mm. And the uh, family restaurant, I don't know if you have the similar thing in States or popular. I know Chuck E. Cheese is the very low end things, but in China, when you have a kid, it's better to take them to the um, uh, family restaurant. So you, they charge extra ticket to get into there, like um, $20 for the kid to play in the play area. And also they can have a very fancy dinner. They cost a lot to get a fancy dinner. Uh, like minimum 200 RMB per person, that kind of cost is already expensive. Mm. So this is uh, some more pictures about Nail Bell. You can see all of them designed in the same style. To us, it's just architecture. No high technology, only the climbing structure, slide, normal things, good library, et cetera. And they, they're planning, the, the size are crazy, uh, between 2,000 to 10,000 square meters. And the biggest one, I think, is in Shenzhen. And they also have a small water park outside the, um, the main building. And now they just opened a new one in uh, Shanghai. The location is very uh, interesting because that new shopping mall was only focused on the families. So they even make the floor out of this uh, uh, soft rubber so kids cannot hurt themselves. Mm. And all the business in the shopping mall are only selling product which related to kids. Mm. The restaurant, merchandise, things like that. So the kids industry is good, just mm. booming. <coughs> and they're planning to open 22 flagship stores, means large scale, and 19 selected uh, yeah, uh, FECs until uh, 2021. 
So that's huge. And children's museum. You know, now we heard we got a uh, GRA is um, designing lots of children's museum in the world, and we designed two uh, children's museum in China. Uh, the Lao Niu Museum is the first American type of children's museum in China. It's located in Beijing, uh, founded by uh, partially by the central government and partially by uh, Lao Niu, uh, Meng Niu, is a um, uh, milk factory. So they opened in 20, uh, uh, 2015, and they just uh, packed the first day they opened. Mm. This location is in downtown Beijing, and the queue just already went outside the main gate. So after a few months of operation, they decided to uh, break into two sessions. So one session is three hours, and they charge very cheap ticket because it's kind of half charity thing. They charge 100 RMB for one child and two parents. And the second one we opened in 2017 was called Song Xingling Children's Art Center. It's also in Beijing. You can see all the fancy things, fancy looking stuff are happening in Shanghai. But all the kind of educational based things are happening in Beijing. That's kind of a you know, cultural difference. China is very big. Each area have their own culture. So Beijing is a bit more educational stuff. But now we're getting more and more requests for the FECs which the developer need to involve some um, educational purpose in there. So it means we need to design that kind of educational exhibits mm. uh, together with all the entertainment part. Mm. And those are the outdoor attractions, small scale, because most of the uh, developers uh, cannot afford the large scale parks anymore. So those small things getting more and more popular, which is only um, uh, not far from the downtown, we call that within the one hour drive distance from the center city. So people can go out in the weekend or after the work days. So those parks already opened in, um, in China. The crazy uh, fact, uh, tractor farms or the, it's a Chinese IP thing, one of the good looking ones. So. Agro-tourism is growing quite, quick, quite quickly there. It's been very interesting, the opportunity for like people to leave and go see animals and, and the farm. There are a lot of smaller opportunities that are in development for that sector. Thank you, Keith, for your insider look at all the new trends in the industry. So with the, a lot of trips to Beijing, a lot of cultural experience to be able to understand and even find all these parks. So thank you for that. I think it's super valuable and maybe um, you know, some of the first time that the TA members have heard such a kind of comprehensive view of what's going on right now in China. Um, <clears throat> so we're about to round it up, but I want to make sure you guys have some time for questions, if you still have the energy. I know we've been going a little long, but um, just to kick off while you're thinking about your questions, I'd like to just maybe go down the panelists and, and maybe in a nutshell, because it's a little late, you know, if you have one piece of advice to give someone who's very interested in being part of the industry in China or working on a Chinese project, whether you're there or working remotely, what, what advice would you give them at this moment, given what you know? I'd give two. Well, one from a cultural standpoint, build a bridge. You know, the people that you're going to work with are really hardworking people. You know, they work really hard. They work long days. They're all really talented. Do what you can to mentor people, learn from them, and have the opportunity to exchange ideas and build their future. You know, because I think our time, uh, there'll be a time when the Westerners aren't necessarily needed, and you're kind of handing the keys over to the next generation from an inspirational standpoint. Second, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, as a business owner who started his company after working at Universal and has started from zero and you know built up over eight and a half years there, uh, you need to be very, if, if you are an individual business owner and not part of a major company, I would tell you that you need to be very conservative with your cash flow. You know, there was a note before about payment that was, was up there. <laughs> When you have a contract in China, I find now that the, the day that you sign the contract is really the first day of renegotiation uh, through that process. And, and I would tell you that payment uh, is not according to the terms that we are accustomed to. So, you know, I can tell you from personal experience, five and a half years ago, there was a point where 
uh, we made decisions about hiring staff and spending money based on money we assumed we had contracted in the bank that did not materialize and we got into uh, some trouble as a result of that. We're much wiser now that we work basically with a plan for cash on hand. Uh, and if the money comes in, great. And, and if it doesn't, you know, we're, we're much more adept at handling that situation. So I would just recommend to any individual owner out there, uh, be conservative with your, with your cash flow that way. Thank you, Lewis. That's very good advice. Um, the one piece of advice I would give you is uh, be prepared to put the time in. Um, like a lot of cultures around the world, we, we run into this in other places, but it's very relationship driven. Um, they don't buy the way we buy. You know, you, you, you go into a car dealer and you like the car and you like the car salesman and you drive off with the car. Um, you know, we may have tea and uh, dinners with the round uh, spinny thing and you know, <laughs> there's a lot of time spent getting to know your customer and so be prepared to spend the time okay, um, my advice will be um, one is to know the right person who can speak the language I'm not talking about the English but the industry language so they can explain what you're saying properly the second might be some common sense is not common in China I can give a very short example and we have designed a commercial street a focus on the national China that period of time. And people at the client was mentioned about we want the Art Deco style. So everybody knows what Art Deco looks like. But so we come up with a very fancy and very colorful designs and showed it to the client. And the client said, no, it's too colorful. It's just too fancy, too many straps and cost too much money to, to build. So can you just you know, follow the Art Deco style? So that is Art Deco. Anyway, and we took the client around in uh, Orlando, showed them the Harry Potter land, uh, Disneyland, and then they fall in love with the uh, Harry Potter, the train station. They took a lot of pictures of that and tell us, that is the style we want for our commercial street. I said, that is not the Art Deco style, that's the industrial style. So when the, your Chinese client telling, uh, talking about something they think they know, you need to just uh, give them um, some examples to clarify if that definition is the same as yours. <clears throat> I think I have to echo a lot of the things that you guys have already said here. It is really about um, building some relationships before you get there. Uh, having someone that's, that, as Titi said, someone who speaks the Chinese language and understands your industry is a absolute needed resource to go in there as a Westerner, no matter what experience you have. Uh, I, I think the other thing I would say is um, I do believe that the real growth in China is going to be in some of the hot topics that TT really showed on. I think that there's a much bigger opportunity for us to be creative with these smaller uh, bite-sized types of entertainment. I think that there's an opportunity to find a projects that are going to last, you know, one to three years and get open versus 10 to, you know, five to ten years to work on some of the bigger attractions and uh, also maybe teaming up with people you know finding a partner here uh, a company that go in at it together to sort of minimize your risk on some of the contract stuff that you get involved with learn Mandarin <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say uh, you know and obviously that's a challenge but in addition to finding somebody who speaks um, Mandarin, if you're going to go that direction, um, we found it very helpful to have somebody who actually understands a lot of the cultural issues, not just the language issues. So there'll be some, uh, you know, American-born Chinese speakers, but you know, if they didn't grow up in China, they may not be able to help translate what's going on culturally. Um, I guess the other thing, um, understand. The, you know the culture the hierarchical culture I think when Bob was talking you know, amazing how many times he said and the chairman came in and he wanted XYZ you know the decision-making process you know is very hierarchical and you can that, you know you have these horror stories where you're talking with somebody and they're saying yes and you agree to something and then tomorrow it's different well the problem is you know they went up one or two or three up their hierarchical chain that person said no we want to do this and they have no choice but to say yes. And they'll, you know, they don't want to say yesterday you said blue was blue and now green is blue. But in that culture, in that hierarchy, 
you know, that's, that's the, the structure. So understanding that, so as you're dealing with that, you know, have that in the back of your mind, knowing who the, uh, yeah, who the answer is. Mm -hmm. I guess the uh, just one last yeah, thing, and it's something that we're still trying to figure out too, is, is how Chinese do you get? Um, you know, we found some success by actually, you know, trying to be, I want to say be more of a Chinese company, but adopt some of the practices, you know, whether it's, you know, unfortunately, giving them credit, you know, letting them, uh, uh, doing the work before you get paid. You can actually get a lot of business, um, but you do also find yourself, you know, now competing directly and, and under the forces. So do you, do you actually have to differentiate and, and still say, well, you know, here's how we do it, and if you don't want to do it that way, convince them that they should, but if not, you know, be able to walk away, or do you start becoming more like them and saying, okay, this is how we have to do to compete? And I don't know if we have our answer yet. I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Hmm. Well, thank you for all the wonderful answers. And um, I wanted to now turn it over to all of you guys out there. If anyone has a, a pressing question, anything you wanted to ask any of our panelists, yeah, <laughs> please, please do. <clears throat> yeah, I believe there has been at least one amusement park or attraction park based on VR. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head where it's been built, but I was uh, just wondering how, what has been the reception, how it's working, because it's part of what Titi was saying, you know, it's probably also something that will be more developed uh, well, there's in a, the sci-fi one, one, right? There's a, there's a domestic park. No, I don't the think it's the that one. The one in Guizhou. Uh, yeah, Guizhou. Yes, the one, uh, to my understanding, uh, having visited it once, uh, when I visited, I, I can only tell you that it, I think we were one of three people there on the day that we were there. Uh, it was not on a national holiday. Uh, customarily some, you know, again to these questions of feasibility, on a national holiday there may be an opportunity if they're running specials with tours that they could really pack the place for a week or two, but on an average day, based on our visit, there was not a lot of activity. Okay. Because it's, it's part of the, the activities that the government are pushing quite a lot. So, you know, once you've got the government behind, it's much easier to do uh, those attraction parks. I, I would think that the, the, the reality of VR in China is kind of like the reality of VR here, that we're still not even used to it. And I think we're much more willing to try something new and be early adopters of the technology and so it is because the government just said we're going to be the head of VR in the next 10 years so they're going to roll them out they're going to pay for them but does anybody want to go to them I think it's the same here I mean we're finding a couple of good VR experiences now with the thing that you mentioned with the void and dreamscape but uh, until we really sort of get into it and really adopt it I don't know if any other cultures are going to jump in and do it without it being as a guest experience. And there's a lot of evidence that shows VR doesn't have the staying power that maybe people would like it to have. Um, you know, you guys probably noticed that it's come off of most of the roller coasters that it was put on, whether you're talking about SeaWorld or you're talking about Six Flags. They took it off for either guest experience reasons or hygiene reasons or operational cost or exit surveys, but it's not there. And the fact that it's not there, I think, says a lot. Maybe Mark could talk about it from a product standpoint. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, generally speaking, you, you don't get the kind of throughput that you need for a mass market product, and theme parks are mass market. So to me, it's kind of like, you know, apples and oranges, square hole, round peg, until somebody figures out, you know, how to uh, adeptly apply it. But I think you're right. Um, what you find in China now, you know, accelerated at their pace, um, along with their social media, is trends. And it's like VR, AR trend, and, and it's going to be a hot trend till the next thing comes along. You know, agritourism was a trend. You know, and it's amazing how, you know, all of a sudden I hear it once, and I hear it, you know, five times in the next month, you know, what everyone wants, and then you move on to the next thing. So I, w I would say I think one big difference about VR in Asia is there's much less of a stigmatism of putting this device on your head as a group. It's much more communal. Uh, here there's an aversion to looking stupid. Where in, in the East there's much more a sense of camaraderie to, to that particip participatory experience. 
I would just say, like, my take on VR, though, and I think a lot of us talk about it in the industry, VR is a wonderful tool and a new mode of storytelling, but there hasn't been a transcendent experience yet. You know, like, when people wrote Spider-Man, that was like a moment that transformed the industry. There hasn't been a transcendent experience in VR yet that I think once that happens is going to change the trajectory of VR. But I think the other difference is VR at the moment is an in-home entertainment component. It's something that you know people like Chris who, who are in the, the motion picture industry have as a distribution channel to create content and distribute it nationally in a out-of-home entertainment component where we need to charge a premium for physical real estate, creating content and operating it, it's a challenging business model to make sense of unless you have some kind of content distribution that you can license and make money on from a capacity, uh, an in-home, out-of-home component, I think. Any more um, questions? Oh, I or would you like to add one more thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know the brand called Team Lab. I think it's popular globally. And I don't know if that fit into any of the category, but that thing is so hot in China. People will line up for hours to get in. And the first time I saw it is in Beijing. It's a temporary show hold for like two or three months. And when they walk in, it's nothing surprised me because I saw so many great things in our parks. But there's a thousands of people going there just taking selfies with flower walls. Not young people, but senior ladies taking pictures. And now they're planning to have a permanent showroom in China somewhere. Team Lab is in Shanghai right now. My friend went there. It's packed, every day packed. Mm -hmm. So maybe that one can become a next thing after VR and AR. So this is more like the Museum of Ice Cream or Candytopia, sort of a walk-through immersive? Uh, the one in Tokyo is pretty substantial. Yeah. They have a lot of lighting technology. I mean, there's you know the requisite projection like Atelier de Lumiere, but yeah. the one in Tokyo has some really interesting installations and uh, significant yeah. li lighting technology. In it. I think that's the uh, the learning lesson here is that it's it's great all the real time graphics and the interactivity that was kind of born out of uh, VR and the video game but it's, it's how you use it maybe off of a headset and on video walls so that it kind of comes back to you know, what Mark analyzes all the time, which is you know the throughput of human beings and what is going to make that a, a full family experience without getting sick or confused or hitting their heads against the wall. But I think you're right, Lewis, that there's going to be some kind of uh, maybe several seminal works yet to come. I, I believe maybe in the AR space, AR combined with standard theming and uh, ride systems that would be um, kind of interesting. Stay tuned. Well, too. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, like, as you all presented, like, a, a lot of uh, a lot of like a project already got like developed and like uh, China in general had a very drastic growth like over the past a like, couple like decades. How do you foresee for the next like five, ten years like other than the existing project? Like do you see it slowing down like in project development wise or do you see like it's going to be like a trend like it keep growing for like a longer term in the future? Well, I'll give you a, just a ma on a macro level. I think the th one thing that I'm most concerned about is just the the overall economics of China right now. I mean, they are slowing. There's huge issues with trying to like absorb the amount of debt, both like on books and off book debt. Um, you know, we talk about Evergrande. You know, they're building this you know billion dollar project. You know, they're funding it right now with deposits on houses and such. I mean that's a huge amount of, of of like debt that the construction companies are giving them, and you know probably more than the trade war that everyone talks about. It's kind of the overall you know trying to get rid of that debt level is slowing a lot of projects. I mean a lot of projects we're on just seem to like have slowed down. So I think in the short to midterm that might be a bigger influence on on how many of these projects actually happen. I think there's going to be, uh, first off from the entertainment perspective, theme parks have already begun. We, we've seen from what we were doing five years ago from a design standpoint, a, a significant shift in the market. 
I would safely go on record believing that I think there's going to be in the next five years, after the 67 projects that are in construction right now open, I believe there's going to be a significant consolidation in the industry. The business model for these products is not sensible in, in, in many instances. And as their economy slows or changes, many of these products will have to consolidate either close or they'll become owners like Sunak who come in like a Six Flags and buy up and manage a lot of these properties. There will not be this slew of individual owners that exist now. And I think it's highly realistic to think that the lower hanging, lower quality products in the industry have to close. They, they, they won't be sustainable. Um, uh, the latest news I got, there is um, Sonic, the company who bought all of their Wanda parks and also Wanda hotels, um, had a new policy that they will open the park gate for free and people will buy individual ticket to get on the ride. Since October, now all of the Sonic parks are free to get in and to pay for the food and individual attractions. I don't know um, if it's a new strategy to, you know, to pay the, the, the bills, the, the bills better, or there's a new, new trend. But I'm seeing in the next five years, there'll be more and more high quality parks because in two years from now, Universal Studios, Universal Studios is gonna open in Beijing and people seen, already seen Disney, Disney World in Shanghai. They know what is a good product should look like. So after the comparison, some small parks, low quality parks will close down, but high quality parks will start raising up. Okay, um, one more question, maybe our last question, if there's one more brave soul in the audience. Yes. What are you putting in a health and wellness park? Let's repeat right. the question. I believe you say, where, where, is there a health and wellness park? What do you put in a health and wellness park? Is it well, Sephora products or is it uh, you no, know, it's yoga? Well, well, I would say it, it's a combination from what we're doing in Junlunko is sports is a huge growth market right now in China. So marathons, uh, Ironman competitions, swimming, uh, spas, different kinds of components that you know I would say people in California are accustomed to from a daily lifestyle standpoint but are completely new from a marketing standpoint in China and nature walks, kayaking, outdoor camping. There's a lot of opportunity when you think about the full repertoire of outdoor life in California to bring that to China as, as a component. Also very interestingly, again from a cultural standpoint, uh, Weta in New Zealand is currently opening a Chinese medicine museum, an entire campus based on Chinese medicine uh, in Zhuhai on Henshin Island, which is another element that is a component of uh, that culturally, looking at that museum, that kind of content and that kind of cultural relevance to grow and add to those things in the future. Thank you. Amazing questions. And I just feel so honored just to have you guys all here tonight on a Monday after a, a holiday. Um, as you can see, you know, our panel, this really is very So please help me in congratulating our panelists. <laughs>